would you call yourself in the world? In terms of my title? What would you call your title? Like all of the titles that you wear, maybe starting from, you know, dad. It's funny intuitively that you said that first because I have had a fair amount of resistance, not to that title, but to um, that taking a precedent in my life because I've been focused on what I've been quote unquote missing out on and what I'm not doing and what I could be doing and what I could be creating. And this, the last few months has been really, you know, I mentioned this earlier, has been really tough for me. Really, really tough, man. And 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 equally as, if not more, enriching and beautiful and all the things and watching my baby girl grow and coming into her personality and just, you know, her having um, an affinity with what feels familiar and comfortable and therefore safe in her nervous system and then what she's she has a propensity to gravitate towards, which is her mother and myself and us and that's so beautiful to witness that and her coming into her laughter and her joy and finding her little tootsies and her footsies and her hands and her thumb in her mouth. Like these are all developmental leaps, but they're so beautiful. And I've had this aversion to, to not again, not being a father, but holding that title. But when you ask me that question, the first title that came to me is father. Because the last few weeks, I've really taken a turn deeper into what does it mean to be a healthy man? What does it mean? How do I want to be in the world? I've been looking at my, not just looking at from an analytical perspective, but feeling into my past, my childhood, my relationship to my father. Again, nothing I haven't done before, but not from this vantage point, because now I have this little girl that I'm responsible for. We spoke about responsibility earlier. And i not only responsible for, I want to be in her life. I want to be present in her life in ways that both my parents weren't, particularly my father. And I want to be in such presence that I'm not concerned with what I don't have or what I'm not doing or what I could be doing, but that she has captured my attention and my presence in that way. And I'm in joy and contentment and connection in being in intimacy with her. And so that first title is Father, man. Like it's really Father. Yeah. Yeah. What would be the second title? Um, partner. Because what makes me a, a better father is, is my partner. Um, or my relationship to my partner, I should say. It's the the cohesiveness of that relationship. And we've been unpacking that a lot the last few months, particularly uh, in greater spaciousness the last couple of weeks because we've been holding resentment towards each other and it's been frustrating and challenging and sleep deprivation will hurt you as well, particularly on Christine's end. That's been very challenging for her, um, but she's dealing with it so well. But it's, it's been difficult and so we've just come together in, in greater intimacy and connection the last couple of weeks um, and it came to a head though, it hit, it hit rock bottom. <laughs> it does. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, to the point where we were both, con- I mean, how seriously were we contemplating separation but we spoke about it, we verbalized it for the first time in ever. So to, to even verbalize it, was a big thing and and I didn't like how that sounded she didn't like how that sounded but it was we do we keep arguing or do we keep seeing each other in tension do we keep just surviving or do we actually do something about this and so we're very blessed that we had someone that we trust immensely that could look after Athena we created some space for ourselves she had a night away for the first time ever from Athena we just had a staycation but we created space and I just took ownership man and responsibility some big things that I hadn't taken responsibility for. And a lot of my old trauma was coming up. And what I realized at great depth was that, you know, new experiences will evoke uh, new layers of old trauma or old old past experiences. And that's what was happening for me. And instead of really being with them and dealing with them, I was in the victim mentality. I was making excuses. I was stuck in my misery, and as a result of that, I became selfish from a defensive posture, not from a place of wanting to hurt anyone, but from a place of my wounded inner child was coming up. My little boy was very rattled, and I wasn't working with that part of my psychology, and I wasn't working with that part of who I was, and as a result of that, I was projecting, and I was resentful, and I was short, and I was abrasive and impatient, and I was being all the things that I never wanted to be, which was what my father was, and I would... I would you know, I would be holding my baby thinking, oh, I really need to be working on my computer doing this thing. And so I was really disconnected and Christine could feel that. And 
I was just walking around either very moody, which again was a byproduct of my environment growing up. And I was playing that out again because it was familiar. And I was, I was I had regressed into a familiar situation of father, child, wife dynamic, which is what I witnessed growing up. And just this time from a different vantage point, obviously not being the child, but being a parent and the father. And I just took ownership of my behavior. And, you know, the, the wonder of our relationship is that we've done so much deep work individually and together as well, that we've got solid foundations that we can repair uh, quicker than, you know, we have in the past. And so she felt my sincerity and felt the olive branch, the olive tree, you know, being ext extended. And that's often enough for her. That's the, that's the, that's the opening. And then from there, we just continue to be consistent with each other, particularly me, and really just step into who I am and who I want to be in the world. And that is, I want to be a very present father. I, I want to, I want this to be, man, here's the thing, Skip, you, you know me well enough to know that I'm never going to be out of my Dharma, man. I'm never going to be out of service. I'm never going to be out of creation. That's just an innate part of who I am. I mean, I do this shit at midnight if I need to. I, I, it doesn't matter when. Like, I can still prioritize my expression in the world. And I was just caught in fear that I couldn't do that. And I, I would be forgotten and I would be insignificant. And that's not my adult self. That's my little boy. Feeling insignificant, feeling disconnected growing up. And so for me, it was realizing that I'm always going to be in my power. In fact, actually being with this girl and with my family in ways that my family need me because I made that commitment, I made that choice, actually creates even more freedom and spaciousness in my life. At least I feel that way. That man, that right there, that feeling of sincere spaciousness and freedom, I've been craving that, but I was craving it from a place of resistance and a place of fight and I just, you know, part of my story is I just got to, I've, I've got to learn to stop fighting so hard. So what does that look like? So now you're mm. like, okay, I want to be a more present father, mm. but you've caught yourself so many times holding Athena. She's six months, five months, uh, nearly five months. Yeah. Five nearly months. Five months. Right? And now you're like, okay, I want to be different. What do you actually do? Cause I've, I've been down this road and I know mm. what that feels like. But how are you, what are you doing to actively shift that? Is it just the perspective was enough and now you're fully present or is this a process and what does that look like for you? I think it's both. The internal perspective is the vast majority of it though because that's really what dictates how I move through the world and how I relate to others and relate to myself. So that internal perspective shift and that recalibration through you know deeper emotional release work as well because I wasn't prioritizing, I wasn't prioritizing, mm, my inner work time, so to speak, right? I wasn't moving the energy that I needed to move somatically. I wasn't breathing. I wasn't doing the trauma release exercises. I wasn't being with the stuff that was coming up. Instead of transmuting it and taking space to be with it, I was really just converting it into, let me ignore this, but then it's going to come up in different ways, in unhealthy ways. So part of that is me not doing that anymore and, and then allowing that internal perspective shift and that consistent reorientation towards oh, I'm remembering who I want to be I'm remembering who I actually am and I'm remembering what I actually desire and in doing so and being more available for I mean here's something for you right so my wife gets way less sleep than me way less sleep than me because you know she's up she's breastfeeding she's then pumping it's a woman's role as a mother man it's intense you, you, you understand this I know you do and so she says to me, when was it? Oh, what's today? Monday? Was it yesterday? Yesterday morning. She said to me, hey, tonight, why don't um, you just, you know, you feed her at 1030 and I'll take the night shift. I'll just do it all so you can get some sleep. Right, bro, like I've got tears in my eyes now. Just fucking like, and I'm sleeping, I'm not way more than her, but a lot more than her. Okay. And I'm, man. That's because we're connected and she feels how I'm supporting her. That is even, there's a deeper level of freedom and spaciousness there. Now, I, I didn't reject the offer. I just said, thank you, but we're good. Let's just keep doing what we're doing so at least you can get some more space and sleep too, right? But for her to offer that, 
that's a testament to us doing our work together and just being present to what's arising as opposed to trying to ignore it and sweep it under the rug, which again is a pattern that I witnessed in my family, not only my parents, but my grandparents as well. Right. And in fact, all of my, all of my extended family as well, they would just, any problem, they would just sweep it under the rug. They'd get angry at each other and fight and do all those things, but there would be no resolution or repair. So every argument just kept compounding and compounding and compounding. And, and I just didn't want that to happen with us. And I could see that pattern playing out. And that's not my pattern. I can choose. We can choose. Every moment we can choose. And I feel like with a newborn, there's a there's got to be at least 70 triggers a day that are happening. <laughs> a lot you know? number. Like yes. a lot. Like a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot. So do you have just like daily practices where you just go over and you just like hug her randomly through the day? Christine or my, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100% I'll send her messages. So what are your things? Yeah, yeah. you send her messages. So even if I'm in the same house, like I'm upstairs, she's downstairs. <laughs> I'll send her a text. I'll, 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 I'll be dramatic and I'll say, pause. Hey, come here. <laughs> Give her a hug. Um, I'll ask her if she needs some a massage because she's just tired, man. She's just so tired and she's, Okay, she's paused and pulled back on business a little bit, but it still needs attention. And that was all part of the plan. I should have spaciousness. You know, she's been, she's developed such a, a great business over the years that she can do that, as can I as well. But, um, you know, particularly Christine in this way, but just to support her, to ask her if she needs anything, what does she need? So I'm, I'm cognizant of asking her, hey, do you need anything? Can I support you? How's your day looking today? Do you need me to move something to take care of something? See, that's the thing. Like it was all about me before. It was all about my schedule, my priority. I've got clients here. I've got this meeting there. I've got that there. No, I can't shift that. I can't. It's more so now. It's not, of course, I'm going to shift everything and anything, but tell me what you need. And if I can shift it, I'm very open to doing so. And I will absolutely do my best and ask questions. Was that right out of the gate or did you learn that over the last five months? I've learned that that wasn't right out of the gate. No way. That is something that has, has eventuated more so the last even couple of weeks, really. It, it, because we've settled into, oh, okay. This is who I need to be. This is who I want to be. I'm not being this person. Let me stop fighting it. Let me start being with it. And that just has opened up a channel of communication, but a channel of intimacy and connection as well. Yeah. When you, and I, I realize this wasn't a very serious conversation, but when you guys had that conversation where you mentioned separation mm. for other people watching, what are sort of the parameters that you would advise them where like... Is separation an option in a healthy, like non-toxic or abusive mm. relationship? And and what would you recommend people look at with that? Yeah, a anything and everything's an option, right? Realistically, it wasn't an option for us because we don't want that. We were we were living from reactivity. We were we were acting from reactivity, right? I, you know, and I mentioned, oh, maybe I'll just move out of the house because it's not pleasant being here. And I mean, that's that's a very easy way out. That's not, that's not who we are and that's not what we want. I don't want to be away from my daughter and I don't want to be away from my family. That doesn't feel right in any capacity and it didn't feel right for her. So if you're living from reactivity and you're coming from trauma and you're acting from that place, then it's the quote unquote wrong decision. How, do, how would you know, like if you're in the moment you and you're your not body. Stephanos? Yeah, you feel it. You feel it. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we feel it in our bodies. Now, we may not be attuned to what's happening in our bodies, but if we pause to the thing that we just said that is a risky thing to say or a big thing to say in a relationship, whether it's separation, whether it's moving out of home, whether it's some other arrangement, right? And we just pause for a moment. Do we feel spaciousness and openness in our in our bodies? Do we feel a tightness in our chest or in, in, in our stomach? That's an indication of something. Let's explore that. Let's pay more attention to that. Now, it's easy to say that the more experience we have with our bodies, the more attuned we are, the more somatic practices we have, such as breath work, as an example, such as trauma release exercise. So breath, sound, and movement being the triangle of somatic um, engagement, right? The more we have access to that, the more we can assign genuine meaning to those somatic expressions or experiences. Okay, so if I feel that tightness, if I don't feel the spaciousness, the first thing I can do is body, breath, and sound. Absolutely. And just like, okay, if I can just get to the point where I don't feel that tension, then let me look again at whatever I'm talking about. Yeah, and one of the ways that we can be, well, we first want to be in deeper communion with that, if it's tension, with that tension. So what could be in deeper communion is mental attention to that place, hand on that place as well. So we're, we're touched there. So there's, there's genuine touch on that place, which again, anything on the frontal plane through our nurturance canal, 
promotes a sense of parasympathetic activation, which can't, which regulates our nervous system. So you're saying if I touch anything on the front side of my body, I'm going to be calmer. From here, for, from the top of the forehead, essentially, to below the navel, yeah. But even if we just go below the chin to below the navel, like on the throat, the cheek helps as well, anywhere through here. And we accompany that with slow breathing. <laughs> Sorry, I just I just thought of like, your partner's freaking out and she's in a moment and you're like, here, here, let me just touch your cheek. And she's like, what? Get <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Um, so it works on yourself, maybe not others can do on others if you have that agreement in the relationship mm -hmm. absolutely okay how tell me how i would set this agreement how do i do this conversation yeah so any agreements that are had in any relationship must be agreed upon and set out when you're feeling connected not in the middle of an argument not when you're in tension not when you're in sympathetically activated nervous system response when you're calm so these are proactive conversations that you have that, that there, proactive conversations. Yeah, yeah. So as an example, mm. I'm like, okay, way ahead of time. Like yeah. in the honeymoon phase of a relationship, you can start to set 100%. these proactive conversations. What are some of the ones you've set with Christine? And can you kind of lay out what that conversation looks like? Yeah, for sure. What are the most important ones? Yeah, so one that comes to mind is how do we want to disagree and or argue? Right. And so, again, we would just have these comments. So let me actually go back. So when Christine and I first met and we met virtually, we were introduced by mutual friends, Akira and Renee, who, whom you know quite well. When we were introduced by them, we, we began this, you know, conversation, communion relationship on WhatsApp. And one of the things that we did is every day, pretty much every day, we would ask each other, five questions. So on day one, for example, like Monday, I would ask her five questions, three to five questions. Any question I wanted to ask her, just get curious about who she was, her life, whatever, right? Could be something funny. It could be if you could be any animal, who would you, what animal would you be? You tell me your greatest fear, whatever the question. But those questions that I asked, I would also have to answer. And then once we both completed that, she would set the precedent for the next five questions. So in that time, we discussed an array of topics. Now, as we deepened our connection and we realized that, hey, there's something maybe here that we haven't met yet. So we were quite, I guess, grounded in that saying, we need to smell each other. We need to, <laughs> we need to touch each other. We need to get in each other's presence before we make any decisions. But there's definitely an understanding and an intuition around and an awareness. Oh, there's a connection here that is beyond platonic. We started deepening our questions because we started actually searching for, well, how would this person behave in this situation? So if we're having an argument, how would you like to resolve that argument? How would you like to communicate? And that was literally one of the questions. So we were asking these questions before we even met physically, right? You can do that at any point. Anything that's important to you, make a list of the things that are important to you in relationship. And then proactively bring them up and get curious. Now, you may be on different pages. That's okay. Can you reach a middle ground? Because how your partner thinks about something is really dictated by their personal experiences, their upbringing, the interpretation of those experiences and their upbringing, and how much resolve they've gone into around the wounding in that experience. And so if we compassionately and non-judgmentally understand that, we can have more open communications using something like the Imago Dialogue or nonviolent communication as a communication tool to really hear each other and feel each other and be heard can be super empowering. And then you come to resolution. Now, you may agree this is how we argue. These are our do's and don'ts of argument, right? <laughs> Tell me why you're laughing. Keep going. Okay. I think I know where you're going. <laughs> okay. These are the do's and don'ts of argument. We've broken every don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nearly all the time. <laughs> yeah. But we do keep coming back. Yeah. And we and we repair fast every time and we break less of the rules every time. But we break them every time pretty much because we, especially me, just straight into my reactivity, straight into my defensive posture. Like It's like the world's attacking me. It's you know, I'm, I'm regressed to when I'm a little kid and there's violence in my household and you said something that you disagree with me that means you hate me that means it's the end of the world that means i've got to fight Oof. it's still in my nervous system but i'm so much better her response is a little more oh there's aberrance or violence or big loud noises i'm just going to withdraw and not speak my truth and i'm just going to hide that doesn't work well for us so the commitment is that she's going to speak her truth my commitment is i'm going to be less reactive less loud less I guess, ethnic, Italian and Greek, 
be less of that and just more curious. So we make these commitments. Well, another commitment we have, which is actually pretty cool, I think it's and, cool. And I also want to mm. point out, it sounds like these commitments are what you would like to see in yourself, yes. not what she would like to see in you. Correct. Absolutely. Because it, it, it's about me and it's about her. And so I want to take ownership and responsibility, <clears throat> sovereignty of how I show up. So I want to get really clear on that. So I need to explore that myself. Now I can have feedback from her, no problem, but it needs to come from me. One thing we do is that when things get very intense, whether it's like we're losing hope or there's despondency, uh, we close our fists and we raise our hand in the air. And what that means is that's a symbolic, that's, that is symbolic of no matter how difficult it is, we have each other and that there represents, that fist represents a whole and that whole can elevate beyond the current intensity of the very temporary problem. So if you catch yourself or she catches herself in an extremely heated moment mm. and she remembers that for just a yep. second, she yep. can just do that or you can do that. Yep. That's a beautiful. Yeah. And um, it really does. I mean, t to be honest, it's it's been uh, 100% hit every time. It works. It works in terms of defusing the intensity. And then from there, we'll, we, we will, again, we have agreements around, do we need to take space? That's on the conversation. Like, do we come back to this this evening? Do we come back to it in a couple of hours? Uh, do we just go for a walk and just clear the air and then and then return to the conversation from a different vantage point? We have those options as well. In fact, quote unquote, scientifically, that works quite well. There's been a lot of research done in when couples are arguing, if they create space from each other and specifically both of them would go for a walk, essentially just release some endorphins, read a book or the newspaper or something completely irrelevant, not how do I fix this problem that I'm in right now, but completely irrelevant to what you're facing and give it at least two to three hours and then come back and speak from that place and communicate and connect from that place, that can be quite useful in diffusing the intensity of the situation. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Do you yeah. have any other uh, symbols or things like that that you have like in your back pocket? For me personally or for our relationship? Ooh, you personally. <clears throat> see, I see symbols is an interesting concept to me. So for me... All of life is symbolic and symbols is the oldest language we have access to. And that's why I'm so fascinated with what I do in the world because essentially I, I look at patterns in people and relationships and just the world. And patterns to me are symbolic of what's underneath and then what's underneath and then what's underneath. It's like this, this infinite, not regression, but this infinite um, spiral into depth that goes in every single direction. And so symbolically for me, I don't have any physical gestures per se outside of that. But what I do have are my grounded practices, my daily grounded practices, which for me are symbolic of elevation or expansion. And so they include exercise, generally high intensity, um, uh, cold, expo cold exposure, because it's challenging. And because it allows me to calm and regulate, and I do a fair amount of thinking and feeling when I'm in the cold, reading, breath practice. Uh, let me clarify reading. I should clarify reading. Anything that I'm interested in, anything that fascinates me, that excites me. It could be um, <clears throat> lost ancient worlds. It could be deep sea animals, you know, and, we're, and, and it could be dinosaurs. It could be something to do with psychology, spirituality, history, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. Um, and quiet time. These are really staples in my life. And I don't hit all of them at, at, uh, every day, but I'll hit, you know, most of them, vast majority of them every day. That quiet time for me is really important. How much man. quiet time? Honestly, as much as possible. If I can get two, three hours a day where I'm just sitting and being quiet, eyes closed or open doesn't really matter, and I can hear my breath. And that can be separated in chunks, right? If I can get it a couple of hours straight, fantastic. That's these days at the moment, it's that's a lot more challenging, but whatever I can get, man, I'll take. Yeah. yeah. I know you're like a super evolved, extremely conscious parent and you have all these incredible, know you know, that. fathers and mothers that you're around and couples <laughs> that, that, that part's true. you work with and, and just incredible people mm. in your community. And I know as a piece of that, you shouldn't place any sort of dreams or hopes on your daughter. But if you did have hopes and dreams or you saw things in her, and she was going to listen to this someday. What do you think? Um, what's the magic that you see in her so far? Mm. 
Yeah, it's difficult to not project, all right? Um, but you're asking me to project, essentially, so yes. I, I can... I'm asking can you to voice that. any projections yeah. that exist, and yeah, if they yeah. don't, then we'll skip to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like most uh, parents, I want her to excel at everything. <laughs> it's to be the fucking best at everything. <laughs> Athletics, music, intellect, history. You remember Twins, the movie Twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. and Danny DeVito? Basically, just be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You just grew up on an island and you were epic at everything. That. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. But but seriously, like I envision her uh, definitely mastering music. Um, she seems to be, at this point, physically quite developmentally advanced, um, which is super cool. Um, and she's very alert as well, even even mentally, like cognitively, cognitively advanced. So I, I would think... Um, some level of athleticism as well. But man, the visions I have, here's what I think is actually more important. I just want her to be, I just want her to be her in her dharma and her in her power and in whatever, her pain, her pleasure, like all of it, right? But what I really see, if I'm really being honest, is her and I going on, uh, and Christine, of course, as well, but her and I on, on awesome adventures, um, climbing Everest together as an example, like legit, man, like really, you know, white water rafting, climbing mountains, going to distant places that are difficult to get to, like trekking and adventuring into the world, you know, and a lot of that, again, will be with Christine because we love traveling, all of us, but like her and I really sharing that, that brings me, oh man, so much joy and so much, um, it's big feelings, man, like really, really big feelings and being able to provide her with that life, like giving her access to those experiences, um, and that, that's some of my projections. Again, I mean, I don't think she's going to hate travel. Like if she dislikes traveling and adventuring, then obviously I wouldn't force her to do that, obviously, but I would not force her to do that. But that would be a dream of mine. That That's the biggest one, that right there, just to adventure together. That Fuck sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Okay, yeah. so let's back up to when you met Christine and you met on the wonderful social app called WhatsApp, Yeah. right, um, through Friends. How would you recommend someone in today's day and age in the world of like abundance that we have mm. of relationship potential? Mm. How do you recommend someone isolate or so to speak, like funnel yeah. the possibilities into love? Yeah, I knew where you were going with that. It's a great question. Uh Jesus Christ said, the truth shall set you free. And I'm sure many have said that before him and after him. Uh, if you want to cut through the bullshit, if you want to be deeply discerning, be super clear and truthful with who you are and what you want. It's really as simple as that. The complexity comes with we don't know who we are. We're scared to find out who we are. We're scared to ask for what we want. We're scared to share ourselves <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're scared to share ourselves because we don't know ourselves. We don't trust ourselves. We have been told or we believe a story that we're not enough, that we're not good enough, that we're not smart enough, that we may be rejected if we express our truth. Because when we were younger, we asked for something and it was shut down. And that became very intense for us. And we developed a story in our nervous system and in our psychology that, well, I must not deserve that. We think we're not deserving. Our self-worth and confidence is low. So we're going to attract individuals that match that vibration and reinforce that story, that reinforce that belief system, that reinforce that paradigm that we are stuck in because the ego loves familiarity. The ego wants to embed itself in familiarity because it's comfortable, because it's safe. And so if we want to cut through and really get clear on the people that we are attracting and have legitimate potential partnerships in our lives, whether they're short-term encounters or longer-term encounters. Again, you have to be very clear on what you want. Be you. And being you means you've got to know who you are, all parts of you, not just the convenient parts, not just the parts that you want to show the world that they're probably not going to get rejected, at least the, 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 the minimal chances of that, but all of it, the shadow parts, the parts that you dislike. Be in deeper communion with those. Work with those. So if you have a foot fetish... You're just like, yo, I have a foot fetish right own out it. the gate. Absolutely. Well, maybe not out the gate, but own it. <laughs> first conversation. Maybe not first maybe conversation. Maybe that's the question. Like if you also had a foot fetish on WhatsApp, right? And you're messaging Christine back and forth. Hey, what do you think about feet? <laughs> I'm just curious. What, it, what? Just what are your thoughts on feet? Just feet in general. What are your thoughts? <laughs> if I send you like seven foot photos, can you just... 
Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, I'm just curious. Okay, it's getting it? weird now. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. So be completely ourselves. So... Yeah, with it, and that's... But let me, let me back up on that, actually, because that's interesting. Because the next question most people ask is, oh, how soon is it to say A, B, and C, or X, Y, and Z, or how soon... You have to be mature enough, and you have to know yourself enough to know when it's appropriate. And you know what? Sometimes you may so- say something that's premature and it's and it's not appropriate at that time. And you know what? Repair is more important than the event. In trauma, when we're dealing with trauma, that shock to the nervous system, too much, too soon, too fast, what becomes more important than the event itself, especially once the event has happened, is how we repair from that event, how we show our own nervous system and our own psychology and the people around us in our own relationships, how we can repair from that. So... If you say something that's maybe out of line, out of context, a little too early or too soon, that's okay. Learn to repair from it. Grow from it. Don't retract and withdraw because that's just going to perpetuate more of the same patterns that you don't want, which is going to bring, again, more people into your life that don't really align with your highest values and who you are. Okay, so here's a pattern I've been noticing in my own life. I have consistently attracted greater and greater women into my life. Mm who are closer and closer, I don't want to say closer because I don't I don't know what it's going towards, mm. but you know, they're consistently more and more epic and amazing and beautiful and kind and all and all of the things. Things right? that you value. Yeah, they're always moving further in a direction, I suppose. That is great in alignment with you and what you want. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. It almost feels like that could be infinite. It's a good point. It could be. Yeah. And that and that so then we've got to look at where the grass is always greener mentality fits into our paradigm of how we see relationships in the world. And if that for you is a, as this is an, as an example, if that for you is a strong paradigm, unpacking that and unwinding that and pulling that string, that thread, I should say, that may be really useful for you. And because it may, now I'm not, I'm not insinuating that, oh, you know, enough's never enough for you, it actually could lead to, oh, I'm actually clear that as amazing as this person is, it's still not quite for me. And you can then examine, am I being a perfectionist? Okay, pull that thread. Oh, I've just realized that it's not about perfectionism, it's about alignment. Or, oh, wow, it is about perfectionism. Shit, where else is that showing up in my life? Where has that come from? What's the source of that? How's it hindering me? So again, there's no, I can't, I I don't know where it's going to go, but I do know that when we pull, the more threads that we pull in our lives and we pay attention to the patterns, because they're indicative of something, they're showing, they're telling of something, the more insight we have into who we are, and then we can present that to the world. But we have to have confidence to present that to the world. Again, that comes back to exploring the wholeness of who we are. That's how we actually gain confidence, by being comfortable and loving, compassionately loving towards all parts of ourselves. And then we practice and learn how to be that in the world. Now, one thing I will say, one more thing to that, is that when we practice with people that are safe, non-judgmental and compassionate, it reinforces our confidence around expressing and expelling the truth from ourselves. That, my friend, is gold. So if you have people in your life where you can be you, and they may disagree, but they're going to welcome that. They'll challenge you healthily, but they'll welcome you non-judgmentally. That's where deep healing takes place, man. That's where expansion of consciousness of self takes place. I feel like this gets into an agreement that you would want to make in partnership with people. And for future reference, it's so beast mode on the edit that you don't ever have to do that. I can I can clean all of that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. that's great. Um, so in partnership, one of the agreements you might make is, okay, I want to completely speak my truth, right? Mm. I want to always vocalize how I'm feeling. That doesn't necessarily, in my experience, mean you want to vocalize it at any given hour of the day, Correct. any day, right? Correct. What's your recommendation for best practices of when to have the conversations around tougher yeah. subjects? Yeah. The, my go-to and what I recommend for so many of my clients, people that I work with, is simply ask the question. So you would approach your partner or a friend or whoever you want to have a meaningful conversation with and say, hey, I have something that's really important to me that I'd love to speak to you about. Uh, depending on what it is you may say to get your insight on or to share with you or you can give them some context. You know, it's it's something that I noticed in you and I'd like to ask you some questions about or talk to you about it, whatever. When's a good time for you? And they'll let you know. And then you have their energetic buy-in and you have their emotional buy-in. You have their curiosity. 
So th- th- there's less defensiveness there as opposed to you just coming saying, hey, bleh, and pointing fingers and projecting and, and blaming and shaming and doing all those things, or even just sharing. Because they may be in the middle of something. I used to do this all the time with Christine. I would just come, she'd be in the middle of something at the beginning of our relationship, and I would just come and I would share whatever I wanted to share and have a complete disregard for her because I thought, well, she should just prioritize me. It wasn't an arrogant thing. It was, it was a wounded little boy thing because I never got that growing up. And so I wanted that because we unconsciously project our parents and our parental dynamics, parent-child dynamics into our intimate relationships. And we do that less and less as we mature more and we get very clear on those patterns and we start to sort of remove them from our, our everyday life and practice. But it's just that. It's just really asking the question. Get their buy-in. Let them know how long you may think the conversation will go for, you know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, two hours. And then you're both in the conversation. And so in my experience, on the flip <laughs> side of this, right, is that with the more feminine partners, right, mm. sometimes you know that there's like a thing. Mm. You know there's a thing. And you don't want to like tug on the thing. Mm. You want to sort of like allow them to be a cat, so to speak, and just yeah. like... Come to you. Yeah. Like, it, I know there's a thing. Yeah. I want you to talk about the thing so we can get through the thing yeah. and it can just air out yeah. a little bit. How how do you do that with Christine yeah. when you know there's like yeah. a thing? Yeah. She, you know, and this comes down to what Jordan Peterson, I believe, calls agreeableness, right? Yeah. Where women are just, feminine people are just generally more agreeable. Yep. And I am sort of like mid to not agreeable. So yep. I'm, I'm more like, oh, I'm just going to like voice the thing. And I've mm. learned lessons over the years of not always, mm. right? Set a time for that. Set a date for that if you have mm. to. With the more feminine partners, I'm like, okay. I want you to voice the thing. Mm. But if I say that, it becomes seven mm. things, mm. right? Mm. What's your what's your best practice on yeah. helping them voice it? Yeah, two two practices on that. So create the uh, create the space first by so if you're noticing something that needs to be aired or voiced and you're intuitively picking up on that and your discernment says, you know what, there's probably something here. Maybe I've done something or maybe I could see how my actions prompted this or maybe something happened in her life and I know that's definitely affecting her and she wants to speak about it but she's holding back. You know, grab her hand, look at her in the eyes and say, hey, if there's anything you want to talk about, I'm here for you. Now, you're right though because sometimes that level of safety opens that person up to want to say not just one thing but two or three or ten things, right? And so you need to be really sure within yourself that when you say that, not that Pandora's box is going to be open, but that you're prepared for the storm or the depth that's about to come. And if you're not, then don't do that. Don't take that action. <laughs> like it's fucking simple as that. Yeah. Don't do but you've got you've got to respect yourself. Or you've got to know where you're at. Can you hold the energy that may come for you and come to you, I should say? Not necessarily for you or at you, but to you. Maybe in your space. And here's something I always say. We have to move away from taking it personally. Holding space in the spiritual communities, particularly in Austin and you know other other places Bali, like Encinitas, Encinitas, and Encinitas, Bali, Tulum, Hawaii. Yeah, you're nailing it. <laughs> hold space, brother. Hold space, sister. No one knows what the fuck that actually means. I'm going to tell you what it means <laughs> from me. I'm going to tell you what I think it means. Holding space means someone can come to you. And you're not activated and triggered in a negative way because you don't take it personally. You're actually literally able to put your stuff aside and really hear that person and be a space for them, a safe space for them to express. So we have to do our inner work and know that this isn't necessarily about us. Now, if we've done something, we've taken action that has activated something within them, we can take ownership of that action. We haven't caused that within them. They're still choosing to respond or react in that way, but we can definitely check our actions. My point is, though, the first thing is, hey, I'm here for you. I I sense there's something you may want to speak to. You don't have to be ready right now, and I could be completely wrong. But if there is, I just want to let you know I'm here for you. But sincerely be able to be there for her. And the second thing is to not even say anything in words, but be that energetic space. So what that may look like is clearing time in your calendar for your partner. It may look like taking her to uh, an expansive place, like a physically expansive place, like a park or an ocean, or mount a hike, get out in nature, uh, do something special, sort of out, out of, a special meaning out of routine, to create the space, take her out of her familiar environment where she's experiencing stress perhaps, and, and then give her the opportunity to just naturally express, without even saying a word about, oh, there's something you want to say or you need to share, say it. They're the, they're the two things that I would do. Wonderful. Do, do. Yeah, thank you for that. 
as someone who's less agreeable mm. and as someone who's more maybe structured mm. in the way that I go about life and generally attracting people that are less so, less mm. structured and more agreeable, mm. right? Which I love. Mm. I love that. I love chaos and I love, because I'm not like that. Mm. So to have someone like that is, mm. is very attractive, right? Yep. To a point. To a point. Yes, mm. yes. And that's that's where we're going with it, right? Is So when you're, some of the beautiful things about having that really feminine partner come with other aspects like indecisiveness, right? Or just general confusion in common circumstances, like even like what to order at a restaurant, right? Yeah. Um, little little things and, and bigger things too, right? Uh, where to go on vacation or, I mean, all sorts of things like that where I'm like, okay, I kind of want to just step in and make all the decisions. And there's a part of me that also doesn't want to do that. Mm. Best practices. So internal practice is always first. All right. And what I mean by that is looking at your own life and looking where, okay, where am I not? I say I'm structured. I say I like clarity. This person is presenting a beautiful opportunity in their lack of structure and their lack of clarity or their confusion for me to step in and make very simple decisions. Now, the other part, there could be another part of you, and this is where internal reconciliation needs to take place. It could be another part of you saying, which you just said, well, maybe there's a part of me sometimes that, I don't want to make the decision. I want them to make the decision and be looked after. Hashtag agreements, right? Like look at where your strengths are in the relationship. Look at not your weaknesses, but look at where the aspects of you that you want to develop are in your relationship and ask your partner if they can support you in that and vice versa, right? But really it's a tremendous opportunity to look at, well, I say I like structure. I say I want to make deeper decisions in life. This is a great opportunity for me to do so. What's holding me back here? What's the resistance? Now, in addition to that, at some level, there's a part of us that is only accepting the convenient parts of our partners when it suits us. That's inconsistent and that's polarizing. Relationships won't sustain in that way. They just won't. And so recognizing that can be super helpful because essentially what I'm saying is, well, if you love this part of her, it doesn't mean you have to love the other parts of her but can you accept f who she is? Because who she is in the parts that you love are equally reinforced by the parts that you don't like. Absolutely. The contrast effect in and of itself, but not just that, but the way it feeds into how she behaves. So it really, but then I would go, well, let me peel that back even more. Hashtag self-love. Where are you not loving these parts of you? Where are you not accepting these parts of you? Where what parts of you are you not loving? Are you not accepting? Are you are you stuck in your routine and unwilling to change? What does an unwillingness to shift and change signify and symbolize for you? It's this fine line. Like I can't tell you whether oh this is a non-negotiable or it's not. Whether it's a trauma response or it's simply a value set. You need to figure that. You meaning. You, of course, but whoever's listening to this, like you need to figure out the thing that you're searching for. No one's going to search. No one's going to search for you and no one's going to figure it out for you. You can have guides along the way that are going to help you with new perspectives and vantage points, but no one's going to figure it out. You've got to make that decision and you've got to wear the consequences or what I call the experiential outcomes of those decisions. It's a more neutral word because sometimes consequences have a negative connotation and, and that, it may be hurtful. But you got to wear that. That's how we grow. We can't avoid that. So I don't know if that answers your question. Absolutely. I think it does. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to take a, a slight turn mm. here. In the very beginning of the conversation, you referenced very casually, like, there's no way that you could not be in your dharma. Mm. Right? Yeah. And dharma being like your life's purpose, your sure. calling, where you seem to be most talented, where yep. your history has led you to be uh, gifted or practiced at certain things. Right? Yep. What, what would you, if you were to tell us what that is for mm. you? Mm. Uh, where to start with that? Uh, so part of it is being a father so, and really embracing that. So for 35 years, I'm 40 years old. So for 35 years of my life, I never thought I'd be a father, nor did I want to be a parent or a father. And I had a revelation uh, five years ago. I was driving to my... Um, Friend's house, Simon, he's a Tantra practitioner and very talented human being. And I was doing some deeper work with him at that point and I was really moving through some 
uh, deep shadow work essentially and I was on my way there and I was quite sad that day I had a very difficult morning a lot of tears a lot of anger just feeling very deflated very physically weak because of the emotional release and um I was in my brother's car I didn't even I didn't I didn't think I even owned my car I didn't have any car I didn't have a car then at that point I was in my brother's car and I was driving to his place and the clouds started covering the sun a little bit I remember the Sterling Highway I was on Sterling Highway in Fremantle and um something hit me and the 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 message I got or the words that came to me was I can be a father just that I can be a father and tears started streaming down my my face And I started thinking about and feeling into this whole relationship with my father because we were doing some work around that at that point. It was it was new work on an old theme, right? But we're doing some work around that, and and it came up very very strongly. And that was the first time that I opened my heart up to being a parent. And so I see that as part of my dharma. Um, To to summarize, what else is my dharma per se? It's uh, being a, a paradigm shifter. And and not because everything that we're doing in the world is wrong or okay, it could be done better, <laughs> but but shifting paradigms, helping people uh, see themselves in new ways at, at an individual level and a collective level, and and uh, both when I'm working with large groups of people, just that one-on-one person, just m- me and that person, it's equally as deep in different ways. But really helping people break free of their trauma, uh, break free of their past conditioning. And to do that in in mass ways, um, and to do that just at the heart-to-heart individual level, right? And I haven't valued that as much in my life, but I'm valuing it more now because I see the impact that I have just by showing up with my daughter, by feeding her, by being there when she wakes up in the morning, by all these little things and how the effect, the net effect of that When I walk into a room, man, she lights up. And to be honest, I'm not being arrogant here, but she lights up with me very differently. And I'm sure I'm projecting here, but very differently to even her mother. Like really, really, even Christine sees it too. It's very different. So I'm putting in the hours. I'm actually putting in the hours and and more so lately, very sincerely. And that never changed the last five months. I've been putting in the hours. I've I've been at some times very distant, but I've been putting in the hours, right? And so creativity is part of my dharma. The way that I write, the way I love writing, man. Uh, I'm not saying I'm the best writer or anything like that. I, grammatically, I'm probably quite shocking. But I, I just enjoy expressing in that modality. I, I, I thrive in it. Taking men through rites of passage, taking women through rites of passage, this deep interpersonal shadow work, like really transforming individuals and collective groups of people because they want to transform. And I'm just a guide. I'm not doing it for them. I can't heal them. I'm not. I don't claim that. I don't want to do that. Just being a safe space. Like if I had to, here you go. If I had to sum it up, bro, it's being a safe space for humanity, being a safe man. Now that means I'm consistent. Means I'm doing my own work. That means I'm in integrity. That means I know who I am. And so that really is my dharma. And I can do that in in every touch point I have with myself and with any human being I meet. And I'm. I'm accepting that in a deep way that it doesn't have to be this thing that changes a billion lives or seven billion lives or a technology or whatever that, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm all for that too. I'm just becoming at greater peace with all the ways in which that can transpire. Wonderful. So rites of passage, talk me through this. Like what's an example of taking a woman through a rite of passage? What would be the ideal situation where she would want that and you'd say that is a beautiful intention and what does a rite of passage look like Mm. well it depends on what that individual is moving through right so let me speak in some general terms here but that 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 are very prominent patterns uh with women specifically because you ask women so uh, let's just look at the uh father wound with women as an example right and so maybe that father was absent Uh, maybe he was emotionally abusive maybe he was sexually abusive uh, to his to his daughter, um, maybe he died at a young age. But either way, there's a, there's an absence there, an unavailability, right? There's a rejection at some level, or the interpretation of that, which will cause a woman generally to, 
unless, of course, that individual is doing deeper inner work on themselves and they're very astutely aware of that, cause them to mistrust the masculine or not trust the masculine. And all men are untrustworthy. Uh, that can be the underlying story or belief system or that there's a vigilance around men or that men aren't safe to be around or that they're just going to leave or whatever it may be, right? And so part of that is reframing and reorientating that entire story. But before we do that, we need to feel, we need to release. So in my in my coaching institute that I co-own with Christine and um, another couple dear friends of ours, Elementum Coaching Institute, we, we teach a... A six step process around trauma release. And before we get to the reframe, we have to release the unfelt feelings. And often when we're young and when we're children, we don't have an opportunity to really express ourselves. What's actually present in life for us in that moment can't be expressed because either the environment's too dangerous or there's no space for us to be seen and heard and expressed. And that stuff stays trapped within us. So I, I, I over, over processes, multiple processes, generally speaking, there's trauma release exercises, somatic exercises, breath practices that, that I'll take that woman through that help her release the pain from her body so she's not stuck in her pain body and that she can create psychological, emotional, neurological spaciousness in her being, closing those trauma loops to then be able to genuinely, from a regulated place, reframe those stories and create a completely new relationship to herself and to the masculine, the masculine within herself and the masculine outside of herself. So that's a, an example of, of what that rite of passage may look like because now we're, trans, we're transitioning from old paradigms of belief and stories into what can emerge that's new for me and that's actually possible and safe and healthy. Gosh, I am so excited about fathers right now. I feel like so many of my friends that are becoming fathers are going to be such epic fathers. And man, dating a lot of women in my life, like <clears throat> it's not common. I know. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. or it hasn't been mm-hmm. in the past. And now it, it seems like, uh, man, I throw a rock and I hit an epic father in Austin. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just full of epic families, yeah. I feel like. And, and maybe Agreed. it's our circle, but it's also people outside of our circle. Like I meet day-to-day people that are just epic fathers. So to kind of lean down that path a little bit, because mm. you touched on this, whether or not they have the father wound, a lot of women I've met have also experienced, I don't know, I don't want to call it anything, but they've mm. experienced emotional abuse in relationship. Yes. yes. And this shows up in different ways. And, and one of the ways that I saw you've talked about before is, there's a lot of like, I'm sorry about things that really, I'm like, that you don't have to be sorry about that. Mm, That's not mm. an I'm sorry thing. Why, you know, don't worry about that. Like mm. it's Hakuna Matata, like big deal, mm. right? What's your perspective if you were telling me how to communicate with a woman who's experienced something like that? Mm. What would be best practices there? Yeah. So one thing that we can do is understand, especially for men because we like to understand, um, but it's, it's also helpful to not in all cases and not um, absolutely helpful, but helpful, is to understand like what is the source of that behavior, right? And so often when when a woman has experienced either abuse from a father or a father figure, or again, absence, there's, there's a yearning to uh, bring that man in her life so that she can appease and please and be the center of attention and in 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 a not in an unhealthy way but just a, it's a little girl just wanting to be pre, wanting her father to be present to her and so as a result of that can sometimes attract unhealthy relationships that really behave in very similar ways to the way her father did or the perception of how her father was and we do that in order to have a redo but we don't know that we're doing that so we can't have the redo so we're in constant cycles of repetition and then every now and then, and this goes for any human beings, we'll, we'll attract a partner that is completely different to that pattern that we often then reject. So let's just say, hence case in point now, right? So you've, you've attracted a partnership, she's attracted a partnership. This woman is maybe a people pleaser or she is a let me maximize your needs and minimize mine. Let me be over apologetic. Looking at where that comes from, insecurity, low self-worth, not feeling full within herself, needing and seeking external validation, 
So what can you do is you can recognize that, you can not judge that, you can be a safe space for her to be curious about her own self. You can seek couples coaching or couples therapy you know, or whatever it may be. You can look at how you're feeding into that. You can look at what you can do to help her and support her in her growth journey of gaining greater self-confidence and moving out of insecurity into power. And you may also realize that's not the type of relationship you want. And so that's an opportunity to be really honest with what you are, where you're at. And I'm not asking you to be her caretaker. and I'm definitely not asking you to be her father. I'm not asking you to take responsibility for her or be her therapist. But remember, there's a reason why you've attracted that as well. And so one the one reason could be to get, oh, I'm super clear, that's not what I want, this relationship needs to end. Or it could be something else that's deeper if you give yourself a minute to sit in that space and say, okay, maybe this is a reflection of me. Am I too dominant in my life in times where I, I shouldn't be or I needn't be? Am I needing someone that is or sees themselves as quote unquote below me to serve my own ego, to to make me feel better about myself. So am I carrying insecurities? Because like attracts like as well, right? So these are these are a couple of examples of what to look into within yourself. But again, getting curious about where you're at, us being our first port of call, because we have greater mastery and control over that. Control being an illusion, but park that for a second. But that that is a good, I think, a a solid place to start. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm going to take another turn here. Mm. You, in the last five years, since you had that moment driving on the highway, Sterling Highway, I believe, (laughs) in Australia, right? In the last five years, you've undergone tremendous transformation. Mm. And there's so many facets to get into here. And maybe you can remember all these things that I'm going to throw out there. (laughs) One of them being, it's, it's quite possible, from my perspective and knowing you, that you were one of these men that a lot of women would consider unhealthy back then, Mm. right? And you've completely transformed. And this is like the dream of all Disney princesses, right? Is that you would find the man who is the beast and transform him, Mm. right? The reality is you need to transform yourself, right? So that's a big part of it. So maybe you could speak about that a little bit and how that played a role in your relationship with Christine and how that was built. And also the other transformation I've seen you go through that's been tremendous is your transformation with your relationship to business, abundance, mm. community. That That's transformed dramatically from the first time I met you in Jamaica at A-Fest, right? Mm. So those two things I feel like are going to go hand in hand in this story. Yeah, Can you speak to how that's evolved for you and what were the key pieces and I'll just kind of pick at things. Yeah, of course, man. So the 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 beast piece is I think what's really important is that we don't neglect our beast. I think there's uh the plight of the dangerous man is actually really important in society. But it's not the man that is reckless with his power. It is the man that understands and knows his power, knows the beast that he has within, and knows how and when to wield that beast, right? And to be in a very specific particular expression. He's not controlled by his trauma and his reactivity and his insecurities, and he's not power hungry. So my internal transformation began well before I even knew Christine existed. Uh, and it had to, because I had to take responsibility for that and, and come into a deeper dance and communion with all these parts of me. And not neglect them, not negate them. There were some parts that I was done with, right? Like the the part that objectified sexuality and objectified women and used sex as a way to numb my trauma, I was done with that part. I had to go through a process of hating that part of me, disliking that part of me, detesting, being disgusted by that part of me before I could love that part of me. And I still do love that part of me. And it exists somewhere in my body still. It just doesn't control me anymore, I, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not keeping the wolf at bay either. I'm genuinely in a deeper peace with that part of me, and I know who I am. And if if that part comes back, I can be with it, and I can have very real conversations with my wife about it as well. And and that's where I'm at now. I just want to be in truth. I want to be in my truth, and I'm also very cognizant of how I express that truth as well. So that beast part is... That's that what you just said is really important. Mm. You're very cognizant about how you express that truth. I feel like that's a really big topic of how you express the things that are yeah. true for you yeah. that are maybe frictiony. For sure. Right? Because like you said earlier, 
the things that are very likable, you can say in many different ways. The yeah. things that could be taken as scary or taken as intimidating or, yep. or all, there's a, there's a way to present that. Yep. Best practices. I call it selfish selflessness. Another term is enlightened self-interest. So I'm prioritizing what I need. I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier because it's very applicable. But I'm very mindful and aware of how would this maybe land with my partner. So if I know it's a contentious issue, if I know it's a challenging issue, one that's that could be very prickly for her and even for me and for us as a we, right, as an us, I want to give that thought with respect to where may she come from? How do I want to approach this? I, I really want to sit with it for as long as I need to. Could be days if need be. And not to get a perfect, uh, com- not to have a perfect conversation, but to really understand where am I coming from here? Am I being purely selfish? Am I coming from fear? Am I coming from panic that I'm not going to get what I need or want, so I need to vomit and project on her? What's her role in this as well? Like, what are her pain points? What are her shadows that may come out so I can hold space for that, so I can be in that, so I can understand when it's coming up and I don't have to react and we don't get into this escalated argument and tension. So that's a starting point for me, is, big, is really, really thinking about my partner. So selfish to the point where, hey, there's some important stuff I need to share and selfish to the point with how do I want to share that because she matters in this conversation. If so it's it's taking a macro perspective of like okay this is this is very real for me. Yep. I know I need to share it, but I need to share it in a way that she can hear it and yep. I need to figure out what's the important part that I feel like if she understands I will feel safer. Yeah. It's an oscillation between the macro and the micro and it's an oscillation between the the thinking and the feeling. Because in order to 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 quote unquote figure it out, I need to feel it. So I need to be with those feelings. So for example, if we if we're using um you know, sexual intimacy and it's like, oh, hey, I, I feel I need to be with another sexual partner or I need to seek sexual intimacy outside of the relationship. Where's that really coming from within me? Like, what's really, really happening there? Because I'm just pulling that thread of, of sex and sex compulsion and love compulsion that I was such a big part of for so much of my life, right? And if that comes up now, like, what's really happening there for me? I don't need to panic, but I can be with it. I mean, I'm not... You know, as, as quote unquote conscious as our relationship is or aware it is, I mean, that term in and of itself. Anyway, everything's sacred and conscious these days. Um, but, and I'm being a little facetious, but <laughs> as as aware as I am and as, 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 a, as a healthy couple that we are, I still have my own inner sanctum that is just for me, not for anyone else, just for me. And I'm entitled to have those thoughts and that exploration just for me. Now, if... That exploration is left unchecked and it's leaking into the relationship. Then it's my responsibility to be more proactive with that internal exploration that may then have to, not always, but may have to then be an external conversation. But I have to uh, recalibrate that within myself, rectify that within myself. Um, so this this notion of being proactive around our self-reflection is critical for life. I mean, simple thing to do is every day, Spend five to 20 minutes just reflecting on how you've shown up to life that day. Ask yourself a few key questions such as, did my relationships play out the way I wanted them to? That argument that I had, could I have shown up differently? What prompted me to feel sad today? Uh, I had a really great day and I was in joy. Why is that? What did I do? Who was I? What did I encounter to, you know, whatever it may be, right? What could I have done better today? Having time to critically reflect on who we are is so key to our development. And, and to the development of our relationships as well. Wow. So then let's go on to the abundance train. Mm. What were the big shifts that you made between that 2017 and now? Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming you can't just necessarily jump to what you did in 2022. Sure. There, there's some steps there. Big time, yeah. Um, so the first part is a, a deeper connection to my own worthiness and who I am just fucking owning who I am and just being more genuinely confident with that. And that came from, again, inner work, inner explorative work, having relationships, being different in those relationships as to how I was in the past. So that was an important facet of all that. The other was uh, taking some big risks in terms of immersing myself in the unknown, which I'd, I'd always done, but this time I was doing it from a different place of awareness and consciousness far healthier, far more integrated, far more connected to myself, knowing who I was, the value that I brought to the table. So when when I'm very open with this. So when Christine and I first met, 
she and I was very open with this. I had shame around it. It was difficult, but I I owned it. She was probably making twenty five to thirty x what I was making. So I didn't have a lot of money, but I knew the value that I brought to a relationship, and I was growing. I was growing. I was growing. What I needed was people and a new environment to see me for who I was in non judgmental ways. Like Christine really believed in me. And, and I'm the type of person, I very much value networks and, and friendships and people. You know that. You're, you're very similar. Like in my human design, that's, which is a somewhat of a personality test, it's, 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 I, I, I align with. There's a few that I align with. But I people are my thing, man. Like I can't – my success is vested in people, in relationships, in intimacy. And I mean I coming to the US, I had that. Christine introduced me to all of her network. And I ran with it, like, give me an inch, I took a mile. Not in a bad way, but I really honored the relationship and I really honored that dynamic, right? And I put effort and time into it, genuine time, not to get something from it, but because I was curious about this, but what could I learn? So I was hungry to learn, man. And I was finally, in Perth, in Australia, I felt like a, a, and I wasn't successful there at all, to be honest, but I felt like, in terms of my mindset, and not that I'm better than Perth or anything like that, but I felt like a big fish in a small pond, Coming to the US, I felt like a very small fish in a very big ocean. And I liked that. I didn't get scared about that. I got excited about that. I got curious about that. And I just started to grow and I started to educate myself in deeper ways. And I did deeper work as well. And being in that relationship with Christine allowed me to do deeper inner work. I have a very firm belief, man, that the more our inner work, our level of inner work that we do correlates to the abundance we experience in life, whether that's material wealth, objects, money, whatever, or a sense and or a sense of internal spaciousness and abundance. The more inner work we do, it's been true for me, the more inner work I do, the more, the more money I make. Quite fucking simple. And now, like if we fast forward, I wake, I make way more than Christine and her income hasn't dropped. Her income's only gone up since I've been in her life as well. So I needed someone to see me, to hold me. She believed in me. She really did. Like she really, really, she's a big part of my success. But I did the groundwork and I continue to do the groundwork. So it's not just all her. It's not just something external to me, right? But I took advantage of the opportunities that I had and I believed in myself, and I continue to do that, and I continue to do that deeper work as well. And I also have become more intelligent around finances and abundance and the, the energetic spiritual game of abundance and wealth, not just wealth in, in a material sense, but wealth in, in an energetic feeling, in a, a sense of, I say, I call it spaciousness, expansiveness within. So there's been a number of different things, but over the years, I just continue to grow, and I continue to look at myself, and I continue to ask questions and I continue to be humbled by life and not pretend or think that I know everything. Is there like a core message that you would say all of your writing centers around? Yeah, I think there's a couple and they, they uh, intersect, you know. Um, nurture that part of our psychology that needs nurturing in other words the inner child work the the shadow work uh, integrate that into one's being and life becomes deeply fulfilling whatever your definition of fulfilling is right um and the other part to that is is willingness and willingness is tied to resilience and toughness in our ability to move through challenge and our ability to recover from challenge our willingness to do the uncomfortable things but to also celebrate because we don't we often don't celebrate ourselves in life we don't have enough joy we experience enough joy. We don't have enough fun. We don't play enough. And so it's a willingness to go to the uncomfortable places within ourselves and the undesirable places within ourselves and equally be in the desirable places as well. And there's that balance there, right? And so I, I think, to, to be honest, man, I, I, I've i never been a person that is, I don't have an elevator pitch. I suck at that. I'm just, I'm just not that person. And I don't want to be that person either. And so I think, when I look at what my core messages are, because I also believe that we don't have a core purpose, or some people do, but we have core purposes because we're multifaceted beings. And so I look at my core messages, is it's really about not being driven or not being controlled by our unconscious past, healing that, uh, being surrounded by people that really see us, creating safety in our own nervous systems for ourselves and for others, 
um, being willing to just go into life and be into life. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that deeper healing that, that really gives us an opportunity to be the greatest versions of ourselves or ever evolving greatest versions of ourselves. I don't think there's an end point to that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So two questions that are just dynamite that I'm really, I've been really <laughs> excited to ask you. Number one for men, what's the highest leverage shift mentally or emotionally that you've noticed has helped them become more fulfilled or more abundant or any of the things that they're seeking? What's the highest single thing that you've noticed as a pattern? Because you're a patterns person mm. for men. What's the highest leverage thing that they shift in general? So when you, uh, are you asking, just to clarify, are you asking the action or the thing that they do or the thing they do the, the, that they take or the thing that they do different that yields them better life? Is that what you're asking? Both. Both. So the actual change they experience and the thing that they do. Yeah, so the category yeah. of, of change and Got what's it. the what's the number one yeah. thing? Yeah, so one of the biggest problems men face is a sense of isolation and aloneness in the world, not having anyone to talk to, not having anyone to share their lives with. Uh, you know, the vast majority of men are the ones that commit suicide. The vast majority of men are the ones that are in very dangerous jobs and isolating jobs as well, whether it's war or something else. Uh, men are not emotionally inept. They're not emotionally uh, dumb. They're emotionally distant and not emotionally intelligent because they're not taught how. And not only are they not taught how, they're told it's wrong to be in their emotions, as if we don't have a limbic system, as if we, we don't feel, you know. And so when men create community, when men begin to trust other men and feel safe in the presence of other men and also challenged by other men, Man, I, I can't say one thing, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things, actually. So firstly, that sense of loneliness is diffused. And they stop either being um, hyper-dependent or codependent on their partners and their families, and they create space and a life away from their family in a healthy way, though, right? No, 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 no. Uh, let me spend 15 hours a day in fantasy football and disassociate from my family and responsibilities. But they actually... Uh, feel they, they feel more fulfilled within themselves, right? They have men that they can trust and they go, instead of projecting their pain onto their partners and their families and blaming them or letting it leak out, they have an outlet to vent emotionally. And as a result of that, they feel less isolated. They feel more fulfilled. They feel happier in general. They lose weight. They lose body fat. They're not holding onto all that armor, right? They heal and mend the relationship with their own parents, particularly their father, that's a big one, and it happens internally, actually. Their father doesn't do anything different, but the way they see their father, even if their father has passed on, the way they relate to their father, the way they tell stories about who their father was completely shifts. It's interesting, like if we, you children full stop, but little boys, they yearn for their father's attention. So little girls, but they yearn for their father's attention that they, as adults, they'll, they'll recall, maybe if their father takes them on a fishing trip for like a day or something, they'll blow that out to, oh, every weekend we went fishing or it was three days of, it was so good. And because that's what they, they crave that, right? And so that, that changes and shifts when we internally shift the relationship to ourselves. And it really begins with being in the presence of other healthy men that can support you on your journey. That, you know, that, that alone syndrome, that isolation syndrome, man, it's really, really, it leads to depression, it leads to anxiety, it leads to suicide, it leads to violence, it leads to, you know, isolation begets isolation. And we don't have men, men in the community being men, they, they distance themselves as fathers, either they leave, literally the relationship, or they're just working all the time because they, they're, they are receiving some sense of validation, external validation and, and status accolade through their work, which helps them feel good. And all they're doing is, replacing replacing pain with pleasure the greater the pain that we're harboring and numbing the greater the pleasure we require to avoid that pain if we're not willing to face it hence the term willingness why why it's so important so i, I believe that answers yeah that explores that question and then as as much of a minefield as this might be mm. for women mm. what's been the number one category if you will in their life and what's the number one thing that you've seen have the highest leverage for them to become more loving of themselves and mm. fulfilled. The, the feminine often asks, uh, how can I enhance connection and intimacy in my relationships to self and to others and so forth, right? So 
that that has been uh, an outcome that when a woman goes deeper into her own self-worth and stops compensating outside of that, whether it's through sex, whether it's through uh, external validation in partnership, whatever it may be, right? Whether it's through promiscuity, and men do this as well, they just do it in different ways. But when a woman really delves into her self-worth and she knows her value and she heals those past wounds, what tends to happen is the caliber of healthy relationship that she attracts increases dramatically in her friendships as well, like that sister wound is healed too because she's trusting herself in deeper ways so she can trust women in different ways and again, experience that support. And as a side note, somewhat tangent, when men do their, their inner work together and women do their inner work together, we can then actually come together in more meaningful and impactful ways. That becomes very powerful for humanity, not just for the individual, just as a side note. So it's it's really that self-worth increasing, knowing that they are valuable and they bring immense value to life, full stop, right? Um, and healing those past wounds of, you know, kids can be really challenging and difficult, man, as we're finding ourselves and, and developing. There's so much bullying that takes place and ostracization, ostracization, so, yeah, so I said that correctly, and isolation again and judgment and so forth. And that carries with us in our adult relationships, and our self-perceptions, our body image, it gets affected. Our sense, our emotional self, right? the value that we think we bring to life and to relationships. And so that starts to really clear up and become more evident in a healthy, positive way when a woman really does her self-work, her, her um, self-worth work, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Another very exciting question. What are like the core things for you personally that you're like, these are pieces of my life on a daily, like your two to three hours of stillness and silence yeah, with yourself, uh, right? Try that now. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. So what's what are the other core practices? So that's like a daily one. Are there weekly, quarterly, yes. annual? What what are these for you? For sure. So it's it's definitely <clears throat> spending time with other men in intimate settings in nature um ideally uh doing men's work getting together you know getting on the mat doing shadow work that's part of the practice ideally that happens on a, in a in a monthly basis and in a, in a sense on a daily basis in my in in one of my intimate men's groups that we're a part of like we're very open and very real in those groups right it's virtual but we also most of us are here in Austin but um not all of us but we do get together on a regular basis as well right uh two to three times a year uh, at least and that can be some psychedelic exploration as well um together but we're getting together in each other's presence having fun doing the deep deep like all of that right then for me personally as well it's also making sure that uh, ensuring that christine and i have time together sacred time together where we can maybe get away uh, once a month uh for just a night or two obviously before pre pre child was very different we were very much in that space now it's it's still very early so it's a little more challenging but we do our best, right? So that's a priority as well, having that intimate time together. Also sharing um, more extreme practices of consciousness together. Again, that could be psychedelic exploration. That could be um, breath work together, like Christine and I. But I also do this as, as an individual. Once a year, I want to go very deep into that. I really want to push the edges of my consciousness at least once a year, maybe twice. Two to four times a year, I'm doing that in a medium to intense way, but not super, super intense. So these are ways that I'm exploring who I am. Uh, at least once a year, I like to do something, again, from a time perspective. I'm the type of person, Skip, I just want to do all the things, bro. Like I love everything, like shooting, tactical shooting, hunting, archery, skydiving. I just want to do everything. man. I, all the experiences, I want to have them. That's just me. My mum told me, side note, my mum told me once, she said, oh, a um, a psychic once told me that in a past life you died really young and that's why you want to do all these things now as an adult. That yeah, fucking makes sense. Probably right. <laughs> anyway, that's me, right? So I want to do all the things. But at least once a year I want to do something um, that's pretty epic. So do you know Everesting? No. Everesting? No. Okay. So basically it's this guy, I can't remember, oh, Spanx. You know Spanx? The woman that invented Spanx, her husband started this. So what it is, is it's in 
two places in the US, I can't remember where exactly, I think maybe one could be in Maine and the other one's uh, on the West Coast-ish somewhere. Anyway, you, you essentially have 36 hours to go up and down this mountain, right? You you, you go up, I think you you get, uh, uh, what's it, gondola down, but you have ex- 36 hours to hit the, pe- the, the distance of Everest. So something like that as an example, or a, a serious adventure race. I like to do that once a year as well, because that to me is expanding my consciousness too, right? Um, uh, dark retreat, silence retreat, things like that. Um, being with myself, getting out in nature, maybe for a night, an overnighter by myself, you know, just sleep under the stars. Um, fasting protocols. Um, it's you know, any one of these things, or sometimes a combination of them. If I was to do a darkness retreat for say seven days, I would fast as well, just water on that, on that, on that too. So, you know, I'll do extended fasts. Um, the next twelve months, I'd like to hit a, a fifteen day water fast at least, maybe twenty one. Be fifteen day would be the minimum. Um, see how that goes. So, so things like that where I like to explore, right? Um, there's some of my uh, sort of macro practices that I don't do every day, of course, but that I would allocate over the next year or, or two. Yeah. yeah. Okay, final question. Is there any big message that's sort of showing up right now in your community or in the world at large that you feel like would be really important to share and something you'd like to get off your chest in a very professional setting? Mm. Mm. A number of things come to mind, but I guess what what really, really is front of heart for me as well is this, this, the world that we live in today is a really interesting place in the sense that I believe we're over politically correct. And I think that carries a hindrance to how we express and communicate. We're holding back, right? We're, we're demonizing a difference of opinion. We're, in fact, we've been demonizing difference for a very long time in all expressions. And by minimizing that and muting a difference of opinion, I think we're losing as a humanity. I think we're devolving. And I don't, I don't like that. Now, I'm not talking about blatantly being rude to someone or discriminating someone or judging someone. Check yourself. If you have a charge on someone, if you're judging, if you're discriminating because of someone's physical appearance or because of their social status, then fucking check that. And let's all have an opportunity to disagree. Because I think the way that we're disagreeing now is not healthy. Because we're not even fucking disagreeing. We're all trying to say the right thing. Fuck that. I, I think there's a there's a space for us to disagree. We're mature. We can be, I should say, mature human beings. Let's act like we claim to be evolved. We claim to be the apex predator. We claim to be the most conscious, sentient, aware thing on this planet. I can poke many holes personally in my own life, but in the collective humanity where we are not behaving like that, we are not being like that. And this over PC culture that we're in, um, it has a place. It had a place. It has a place, right? Sensitivities matter. Being more thoughtful and selfless around how someone may feel by saying the thing that we're just going to blurt out, it has a place and it's useful. But we've gone to extremes from my perspective. And I think that shit needs to fucking stop. Beautiful. Okay. So when people fall in love with you after listening to this episode, <laughs> what's the best way to get in contact with you? How do they digitally stalk you? Yeah. Or uh, physically, or if physically. you want to do that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably it's, it's all welcome. Um, uh, Stefanosafandos.com is my website. All the information's there. But in my, any of my social media channels, at Stefanosafandos. I'm most active on these days, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I got kicked off LinkedIn, man. And I can't get back on. What? I had such a strong network on LinkedIn. Fuck you, LinkedIn. I'm so upset. I'm so upset. How did you get kicked off LinkedIn? Man, you, you know my Sunday posts that are a little more sensual and erotic and so forth. Yeah, they speak to you know sacred sexuality. Everything's sacred. Sacred sexuality, you know, human interaction relationships at a deeper level, right? Um, so my assistant was just posting that for me and I wasn't looking at the email that it was connected to and they kept giving me these warnings saying, oh, your content's explicit, this and that. They just shut me down. And every time I try and go back on, they recognize, the algorithm must recognize my name, obviously, and just keeps booting me off. Aww. Fuck LinkedIn. You're the- <laughs>
It's a bummer. It's a, it's, a, it's a it's a bummer for LinkedIn, is what it is. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm t- I'm not happy about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. This thank has you, been man. awesome and amazing, and uh, so much to re-listen to for me. And yeah, I, man, we got to get round three, four, yeah. five, six, seven. Yeah, you know. So we'll get there. We'll, forward, we'll get there. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. I, I, I can move.